episode of Video Game Logic. Today's episode was recorded on April the 21st, 2020. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, the cleaner one of the two of us. The caffeine rage? That, that's a low bar, isn't it? May, maybe. Because you're a dirty boy. It's super dirty. On today's show, we will, of course, be discussing the games that we've played. ESRB finally labels loot boxes, sort of. Sony is announcing the Play at Home initiative. <coughs> the N- Nintendo Switch scalpers are using bots to drive up their prices. Valve patents a Steam controller with swappable parts. <coughs> EA patents matching, matchmaking based on retention rates. Uh, we'll have a Steam weekly discovery queue, and timestamps will be in the show notes following their respective topics. And maybe a community corner in there somewhere. Did we have community corner stuff that I missed? No, but we still have to do the email and everything. Ah. Yes. Hello, Rich. Hello. What's up? Oh, well, you know, we haven't really been talking all that much, so uh, it's good of you nope. to ask. Nope. We've been talking for four minutes and 22 seconds now. Not, we haven't been talking at all for the last hour or so. Yeah, not recording Franken content or anything, trying to replenish the supplies. Yeah. Nope. None of that. Yeah, because, oh... I had to reinstall everything. So those who have been listening for a while know that I had some audio issues a couple months ago now, right? And yep. it made it so that USB uh, devices no, no longer worked. It, uh, I would plug in my uh, USB headset and it would just error out, say, uh, driver not recognized or just give me a a, a general error that... No amount of Googling uh, would work. So eventually I found, I remembered that my monitor, because it has built in speakers, also has a three and a half millimeter pass through for uh, headphones. So I'd been using that for the last, you know, couple months. Well, actually it was when we, uh, when I moved uh, that we discovered that. So, uh, so about a month. So now last week, on Monday, discovered, oh, now no audio is working, and it's actually saying no audio devices. It's not even recognizing HDMI cables. That's not good, obviously. And kind of hobbles, uh, you know, doing practically anything that I like to do on my computer. So it was either, well, tried a couple of fixes, nothing was working properly. So eventually, you know, as a last-ditch effort, hoping that it would fix it. Otherwise, you know, it's a hardware issue and, you know, who knows what is on the board that uh, is screwing up. Reinstalled Windows, which was a fun experiment because it, I didn't want to do that at first. Eventually got it installed and, yay, audio works. Now I got to reinstall everything. Fuck. Could have probably thrown together enough uh, programs to get up and running for the podcast last week. But honestly, it was probably better just to uh, go for, you know, pranking content and have a little bit of spare time to be able to do things. So here we are, right? Yep, here we are. Um, We've got a decent amount of content to get through this week, too, as long as all of these topics and everything pan out. So, yeah. And we're starting later than normal. Although it doesn't quite matter as much with me working from home, yeah, but still, yeah, trying to keep... Yeah, and Anita just got uh, noticed that uh, no school for the rest of the year, so she's doing remote learning, or remote teaching in her case. So, you know, uh, we've been doing a uh, weekday uh, alarm just so we can be functioning adults, and, you know, if we have to go get groceries or do something, you know, it's not a complete kill on our uh, sleep cycle as we go full nocturnal. Mm-hmm. But, yeah... Mm-hmm. It's suddenly uh, staying up late to record not so bad anymore true it'll all come crashing down to a stop at some point though yeah but anyway uh games we played indeed games we played so i've got three you've got two and there's a shared one between the two yeah, of us so, so do you want me to go first uh, I, I think i want to go first before you know okay Go for so, it. So, my solo game this time around, uh, both of my games are Game Pass games, because that was one of the first things I installed and had to deal with, because Windows being Windows, I had to 
I basically forced delete the old app folders to be able to download stuff. So, you know, that ate up a fair amount of time. So, damn it, I was going to play some Game Pass games. And one of them I downloaded and played was Recore Definitive Edition. I'm going to be linking to the Steam page for, I think, all of this, actually. But it's more just an easy way to do it. So, Recore Definitive Edition. It has the personality and depth of a tepid glass of water. If, if you're uh, starving, or, 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 yeah, or I guess in this case, incredibly dehydrated for this type of game, yes, it will cure what ails you, but you're really not going to be enjoying it all that much unless you are, you know, hang on Hydro Homies or something, uh, which is a subreddit, by the way, which I think you'll enjoy. I did. Uh, but anyway, Recore, it is a, well, it's a third person adventure, a little bit of Metroidvania uh, ex- exploration. But honestly, it, it plays like an MMO with all the trappings of it. It's just grindy as fuck. It, it, there's an interesting story in there somewhere, maybe, but it's just buried under so much garbage that I just, oh, so... You play as essentially a maintenance worker who is sent to a, a distant planet to help start terraforming it. Because, uh, hey, how about that? Uh, turns out uh, those uh, leftist uh, gr- uh, tree, hab- uh, tree, hunking, uh, tree humping hippies uh, were right. Uh, destroying the environment? Bad idea. Or some sort of plague or something. It, it, it said pretty much... Oh, yeah, the Earth uh, was kind of destroyed. We're uh, sending people off-world to try to preserve humanity. But don't care about that. Right, let's let's focus, on, focus on this. And you're going around trying to basically figure out what the fuck is going on because it seems like nothing's going to plan for some reason. But there's just a lot of what-the-fuck moments. Like, for example, all right, there's uh, multiple times... You have to collect these little power cores or these little power bots. And for some reason, they decide to make them sentient or at least a be able to be afraid. So if something big and scary comes by, they'll run off and hide. And in like two hours of gameplay, I had to do the same thing. I had to go find these little hidden power bots four or five times. And it started to get monotonous because the, the platforming, it's, it feels loose. It's kind of forgiving when it wants to be, but whenever you're having to deal with a challenging jump, it feels like you have to hit exactly. Uh, you're able to uh, sprint and then double jump and then sprint again. Unless, for whatever reason, they have this big glowy ring thing that uh, somehow recharges your jets because science, I don't know. It just it has this weird feel about it that just... I realized it was a PlayStation 1 launch title, I think. I'm pretty sure it was. So it has all the trouble of you know, rushing to try to cash in on the new uh, console. But at the same time, it just feels like it's lacking a lot of soul. A, a lot of character, you know? Yeah. I don't think it was that old. Play- you said PlayStation 1. Was that an accident? or Because ReCore... Was an Xbox One... Did you mean Xbox One instead of PlayStation 1? Oh, sorry. I meant Xbox One. Ugh. Okay. Yep. Now, that's that's. So, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sitting here looking at my PlayStation controller, so... Gotcha. Sorry. I meant uh, Xbox One uh, launch title. Because I I nearly said Xbox 360 and thought, no, 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 no. Uh, the wrong, uh, wrong console. So, I corrected it and then I changed it up. Uh, but... It was a uh, Xbox One uh, launch title, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I remember having that really sad uh, E3 uh, uh, teaser trailer with the dog robot. And how they kind yeah. of uh, you know, said, oh, well, it doesn't matter because we just ripped the soul out of them and put them in another one. Put it in a, yeah, and they put in like a gorilla robot yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and there's this sort of uh, almost Pokemon-esque uh, uh, collect uh, different companions to be able to... Uh, solve puzzles but uh, I, I after playing it for a couple of hours and I it's like okay is there something here that 
I'm missing. I went to watch a couple of reviews because it, it felt like, okay, it, it's, should I stick with this? Does it get better? And it seems like it gets worse. <laughs> Like, you could only have two of the companions at a time, and you have to have the right ones for dungeons. And that's why I think it feels a little MMO-ish, is that it's this wide-open world that has fuck all to do. There's a few hidden collectibles, uh, which are in sort of a Metroidvania uh, a slant of... Uh, well, that's an annoying uh, uh, thing to try to get to. Uh, it looks like there's no way I could get to it. I guess I'll come back later, maybe, if I remember where it is, uh, to get, you know, that obviously glowing chest. And it's not even the, uh, you know, the satisfaction of a typical Metroidvania where, you know, you get this uh, really cool ability and it and it makes you feel powerful. But I didn't get that far. I, it just, I kept getting... Uh, random blueprints for my fucking dog. Uh, so uh, each of the companions you're able to, or I should say at least the dog companion, because I didn't get far enough for the other obvious ones that are in the UI, and we were spoiled for the uh, giant ape one. Uh, you're able to swap out for the uh, individual parts, the uh, head, the front legs, the back legs, and the tail or, or ass or whatever you want to call it. And each one gives uh, different uh, stat upgrades, and you have to Use items that you readily find in the environment, uh, items that are statically placed in the environment, uh, items that are dropped by enemies, which has sort of a, I guess, Monster Hunter feel to it. But it's just none of the uh, tactical combat that Monster Hunter has, because it's a very uh, anemic uh, shooter at that point, with some of the strongest uh, aim assist I've ever seen. If you uh, point in the uh, general uh, zip code of the enemy it'll lock on and uh, start firing at him I mean I realized that uh, the PC port I would say has very little thought put into it because there are such things as waggle A and D and no I'm not joking uh, mash the space bar um, you're I don't think you're able to do full on key bonding you're only able to key bond a few things in one of the tutorials, it actually said, okay, now to switch uh, uh, enemies while you're locked on, press undefined. Well, <laughs> I love that. That feels like like a, a, a specific, like a 2002 PC gaming problem. Yeah. I mean, I'm, what, do I not have enough buttons for you? Can, not, can you not find one? Uh, but pretty much the combat, at least as far as I get, uh, got... Involved matching the colors for each enemy. I only had two of the possible four, and they're laid out in the D-pad, so, you know, it's pretty obvious it's going to be four. Uh, matching the colors does bonus damage, but if you're not matching the colors, you're doing normal damage. And if you charge up a shot, it has a special effect. Uh, the white, pretty much uh, prismatic uh, uh, color, well... And I think it was a stagger. Uh, the red shot uh, has a chance to light enemies on fire. And I'm assuming that blue and uh, yellow, the other two obvious colors, because that's what the other enemies were, will have different effects. But it's just, it just always felt so blah, you know? Like there's uh, so much better I could be playing right now. Yeah. I played this... Two or three years ago, I mean, it's been out for a while, and when the Xbox Game Pass first debuted, this was one of the titles that was on there, and that's when I played it. And I I remember almost nothing about the game. Well, they don't My really feelings on it. Well, they don't really have a good hook. Uh, basically, uh, Jewel, she sounds like she has no clue how to do her job at all. What was there? No training on the job before you got frozen and shipped to. Uh, uh, Tatooine. I mean, I realize, I realize that uh, it's more for the player to have her be a little bit inept and have to learn on the job. But there's a gameplay you know, lore inconsistency, you know? Because her father is this badass uh, engineer and, it, it, well, to go back to, like, Outer Worlds, it'd be like Parvati having no idea how to do any engineering, right? 
or any uh, mechanical work, right? Yeah. So you're saying that there's some ludo narrative dissonance yes. in this game. Yes, if you want to use the ten dollar words. I do want to use the ten dollar words. Yeah, I don't. I basically don't remember anything about this game. I remember saying, "Oh, this is okay. I could come back and play this later." And then I just never did. Oh, I got. And three years have passed, so I got frustrated with it because I hit the same puzzle, you know, multiple times, and one of them. Well, well, they. This is one of those games that has all the secrets on the map, so you could obviously see. Okay, well, there's a weapon cache there, or or I guess I should say a blueprint cache there because. It, Seems like that's the only damn thing you get. Well, it doesn't really matter because I can see that I don't have the abilities to get there. There's no joy of discovery, uh, which uh, is something that drives a lot of uh, of Metroidvania style gaming. It's just uh, you get a cool ability. Now you go try to work it out. You know, where does this unlock? You know, what does this uh, uh, give you? Uh, What secrets can you find with it? It's, oh, well, I... I need that. I need some sort of ability to run on walls to get that obvious chest that is listed there. So it's just kind of takes the joy of discovery away. Yeah, it's like they uh, played a few like Metroidvanias and missed the point of the of the discovery. They played a few shooters. They missed uh, how to make it fun. They played uh, a couple sci-fi games and decided, you know, Star Wars Episode One. Well, you know, you know, that whole Tatooine area, we should make a game that's as bland as that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tatooine without the joy of pod racing. You know, all 30 minutes of, uh, of uh, you know, CGI action, right? Now this is pod racing. That pod racing scene was real good. Yeah, maybe good. the first time, but ugh. The, the only thing that nice. came uh, that was good out of the uh, first Star Wars movie... Or first Star Wars episode, I guess I should say, was the pod racing video games. Those were really fucking good. I miss miss playing those. Part of me though doesn't want to go back and replay them because I know that you can get the one that was on N sixty four now, but part of me doesn't want to go back and play it because I'm the whole nostalgia factor. Like I want to remember it being perfect and not like some kind of janky garbage or something that like we just loved at the time. Sort of like you know? sort of like uh, Golden Eye. Yeah, or Final Fantasy VII. That's right. I went there. Yeah. Well, fight me. Well, well maybe Square fight Enix me. shouldn't have if uh, some of the things that people have been saying about the remake is true. Yeah, may maybe. Um. All right. Uh, is it my turn? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's not. Uh, I'm probably bitched enough about it. There's just a uh, a lot of, eh. Right. Okay. So, uh, I went back and have been replaying both of the games I'm going to talk about this week as I get to them, are games I've played before, have talked about on the show before, but haven't played in one or more years. So, Space Engineers, um, in case you don't know, is kind of like Minecraft in space. You There's a bunch of different starts now. You can start on like an Earth-like planet, you can start in the middle of deep space with asteroids around, you can start on a moon, there's an alien planet, each one providing sort of an easier or a more difficult starting environment to play in. And um, you start with basically nothing, and you build up to whatever you want by mining the environment for resources, um, turning those resources into usable materials, and then building uh, bases, be they star bases or space stations, something. So you can go from uh, the moon to that's no moon. Right. You can. 100%. I've seen people do crazy stuff like build the Death Star and Space Engineers. Um, All at one can, frame per minute. Yeah. If you've got a powerful enough computer, you can chug it along, the Death Star along at one frame per minute. But, um, you know, spaceships and land vehicles. I, I say that because you can now do wheels, treads, hover vehicles. And if you're inventive enough, you can build walkers. Um, people have done those using the in-game systems, like no mods, like mod-free uh, walking vehicles. Um, not really anything that I would define as like, even like a mech, definitely no mecha, and definitely not a mech without mods. They're more like walking tanks, I guess. I don't know. You get into this weird, like, hair-splitting thing. 
But it's still cool. Like, so sort of Battletech is? No, not even. That. Well, there, yeah, there's been some people who I've seen who've done some Battletech-ish type stuff. Um, but not very many people I've seen without mods have gotten to that the advanced level of, of creation. But Space Engineers suffers from the same sort of thing that like Kerbal does. Um, where Kerbal has the Kraken, Space Engineers has Clang. Um, for when the physics go wrong and everything turns wacky and all your hard work for the last six hours just got ruined in a beautiful, brilliant explosion. I hope you F5'd for safety. Um, so there's always that bit of it. And really, the only things that I... They, they've changed several things fundamentally in the game. Um, as far as I can tell, they fixed their performance problems. I mean, it, I've got better hardware since the last time that I played it, but also it just seems to run more smoothly. Like not even stuff that's related to like the frame rate, but the game just seems less janky than it did before. If that makes sense. Like they've really well, it didn't leave early done... access. Yeah. It's like, it's like they've done some work under the hood and have really tweaked it to make it more stable, which is good. Um, Kling still exists, but typically, Whereas before, it would just be like, oh my god, what happened? Why did my spaceship just explode? But now you can actually, most of the time, diagnose a problem like, oh, oops, I accidentally managed to build two blocks inside of each other, and the game physics can't properly figure out what to do with that. And so it causes like a weird physics explosion or something. Um, so that's, that is good. Um, they have added, sort of by default, the training wheels are on. You can turn on what's called experimental mode, which used to just be like the full game. But in experimental mode, you take all the restrictions and the training wheels off. So if you're playing, just you start a game and you do one of the quick starts and you're learning how to play and whatever, um, there are limitations on how large everything can be. Um, you have like an overall world limit for how many blocks that you can place. Um, and each thing has a value based on how com large and complex it is. So like a simple steel block is only valued like one of these points. Um, whereas building like um, one of the reactor modules that is very large and has physically moving parts and stuff on it takes up maybe 50 of these points. <clears throat> and each individual vehicle has its own limit and then there's a, a total world limit. Um, and then there are things as like less objects being present at once. So like if you crash into the ground and you blow up your ship, it sprays out into 10,000 shrapnel pieces in, you know, like a normal in like the, or the, the old way that I am used to, but with these, with this limiter turned on, it's kind of a performance thing. And so it, you can only have, uh, I believe it's 64 independent, um, like random objects um being rendered and the physics uh taken care of four at a time. So a lot of that stuff will just disintegrate instead of like spraying out everywhere. So there there's little training wheels on it like that, which I absolutely hate. I want unlimited I want there to be no limits. I want to explode my computer by having ten million physics objects rendered at once. So I mean it's just a simple box. You check on or off. Do you want to play it's called experimental mode, like I said, but it's like, do you want to play with no limits or do you want to be limited? And you can toggle that on and off in an ongoing save. So if you want to kind of start with the training wheels on and then once you get used to it, turn it off, but keep the progress you've made so far, you can do that. Um, and that adds allows, now that everything's a lot more stable, that adds for some interesting new levels of play to help out in the earlier game before you can really build vehicles and and craft to go and do mining stuff for you. Like one of my favorite things to do is to build a base into a hill now and create like a little funnel where that when you drill out all of the rock and everything falls down and gets collected by like a giant vacuum tube and then fed into your base's conveyor system to be um, processed and into ores and then turned into raw materials for uh, production. I think that's neat. Um, and, you know, because it's all physics-based, you can just do a gravity-fed thing where it drops down into the tube or down, like, a long channel in towards the tube. That's neat. But, so there's that. They've added a lot more customization options for, do you want enemies on or off? Um, which types of enemies, if you do? 
do you want these types of damages? Do you want to allow this thing or that thing? Like, there's a lot of options. Maybe, like, I don't know, 60 different options for things that can be toggled on or off. And then some of them are more sliders, like how much frequency do you want this type of event to happen or whatever. So that's nice. I enjoy the customization because I don't want there to be enemies. I just want to be able to... I, w- I want the enemy to be the environment. Like, if I fuck up and die in the vacuum of space, like, that's the only enemy that I want to face. Um, And then they've added an economy system that I don't really understand. I think that this is more for if you're playing with a group and you want to have additional um goals to reach for instead of just creating stuff on your own. There are now positioned around planets and... Uh, kind of randomly scattered through space, um, space stations and little trading outposts where you can go to. And they're safe zones, so other players can't attack or damage other players. And you can go there for safety if you've turned on, like, NBC Pirates, for example. They won't chase you inside that little field. They'll go away if you go land on one of these little bases. But um, anyways, you can go there and you can you get credits now. Um and you can like sell things into the market for credits. You can sell to other players. You can sell to sort of an NPC trader that's there to, I guess, absorb some of your excess resources. Um, you can buy things from them. Like early on, if you want to get, uh, say, ion thrusters, but you don't have the proper equipment to refine the platinum to actually produce the thrusters because you have to have platinum to make ion thrusters. You can go and you can buy platinum or ion thrusters parts just like straight away. Um, And and then you can have those for a ship and not having to go through the whole process. Um, And then it provides missions. Um, In the missions, it doesn't don't seem to follow the rules you set for the game. Cause I had missions that were like kill X number of pirates ships and then, come back and I'm like, well, there's no pirates in my game. I turned them off. But most of the missions are like, bring us, you know, 10,000 steel plates or whatever. And you get money. Or go steal 10,000 steel plates from the pirates. Yeah. Go blow up the pirate ships and then grind down all of their scrap metal to steel plates. But so, I mean, that's nice. I There's not really a point to it for me as a single player because if I wanted to just like get rid of excess resources, I'd go dump them in space because, you know, Space is the ultimate trash can, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I've just been playing it to relax, listen to podcasts. Um, and I spent a few days playing it, kind of getting to a point where I'm self-sustaining now. Except for power, I constantly run out of power. But what else is new when you play these types of games? Um, but I, I'm self-sustaining and I'm working on expanding and growing. And it's just relaxing. It's a good time. I like it. Runs better, seems to be less janky. Uh, two thumbs up. <laughs> it's got DLC, but nothing. It's all like cosmetic stuff, and I think you can get all the cosmetic stuff in game, anyways. There's no premium currency, no microtransactions. Another two thumbs up. Okay, so do you want to do one together? Yep. As soon as I finish coughing my lungs up. All right, I'll wait. Uh, do you want to swallow them or? <clears throat> yeah, I swallowed them back down after I spit them out. So, uh, Plague or Pollen? Uh, yes. Okay, just checking. So, I've uh, downloaded the Lord of the Rings adventure card game on Game Pass and played it for a bit and saw, hey, this is co-op. And Jerry and I do a weekly just get-together bullshit, maybe play some games. And I got him to download it. And we both have a little mini game club now. Yay! So I download. It's really, really yeah, good. I downloaded this thinking it was going to be basically a Hearthstone ripoff because it looks like one, doesn't it? It looks like Hearthstone yeah, it really does. a essentially a Lord of the Rings skin on it. And looks wise, that's somewhat true, and that's about where that ends. It plays incredibly differently from uh, uh, Hearthstone, so. I guess the big difference is uh, really how the decks are built. So there are four hero types. There's tactics, leadership, lore, and what's the fourth one? I thought there were just three. Oh, there's four. There's blue, green, red. Uh, Then there's one that's a jack-of-all-trades. Okay. 
Uh, anyway, there each card has an attack, a health, and then a willpower, and different hero types. Well, each deck has three essentially hero class uh, or heroes, hero classes. And if you lose all three, uh, your adventure is over. It's all player versus environment, and even multiplayer is co-op, or at least uh, what I played. There may be a PvP element later on that unlocks. I don't know. And each hero has a different focus. Uh, like one will be higher attack, but it may be a little bit more squishy. One may have a higher willpower to help uh, deal with objectives, but will be uh, have a weaker attack or maybe a bit more squishy. One may be a jack of all trades, which has pretty even-ish uh, stats overall. And one may just be a tank. And also uh, some of the more lore-focused characters that have a, a higher willpower may have a... Uh, an ability or a power that they could use to uh, change the flow of the game. Like uh, uh, one of the hobbits I had uh, for uh, our game Sunday, uh, it was uh, Tom Took, wasn't it? Uh, he uh, yeah uh, had a power that would basically make uh, the next enemy attack do no damage. Uh, but overall, he was very low attack. He was very low willpower, had some decent health. But his power is what made him uh, very useful. And the way the deck is built is around these heroes. So as you have heroes of different spheres of, inf of, spheres of influence, you <clears throat> unlock more cards uh, of that type. So uh, if you have one tactics hero, you can put tactics cards into your deck. But if you have two, you can put stronger tactics cards in. And if you have all three, you can put all tactics cards in but you're blocked out of the others. And like I said, it's a very interesting way to build a deck like that because I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I haven't seen anything quite like this either in the way that it handles the um, gameplay sort of mechanics back and forth. Okay, so in all of these tech games that I've played, um, there's kind of the, the Hearthstone knockoff or the Hearthstone copier, and then there's people that try and set themselves a little bit apart without being too much apart from Hearthstone. Like, I think about the Elder Scrolls card game where that it does a little bit of, like, lane... You, like, you've got multiple lanes you have to manage at the same time, but it's, like, two or three. There's some interesting sort of special objective stuff, but nothing on the level that this gets to. Um, and at the end of the day, it still plays a lot like Hearthstone. But this game... One with turns, you you really have to change your whole way that you think about playing it. Because with Hearthstone and Hearthstone light games, it's basically I take a turn and I do everything, and then you take a turn and you do everything. Basically, take it each turn, take a turn to punch each other in the face. Yes, but in this one, um, we each make a move. Basically, it's more like playing. You know, a, a, there's phases. And a phase ends, or, or a turn ends, Basically, after well, everyone has done well, all the stuff, the, but we go back the and The easiest forth. way to, uh, is to borrow some of the uh, Magic the Gathering uh, terminology, where uh, there's the upkeep at the beginning of the turn, where certain abilities may fire, or and you also draw resources. Depending on the difficulty, uh, you have so many resources come in, and so many cards. Then you have the first combat phase, and the combat phases continue on, until there's no more combat phases, then you have the end phase where any cards that have a, an effect at the end of a turn fire off, and then you go back to the upkeep phase. That's the easiest right. way to say it. And uh, you go back and forth between you and the uh, computer. So, like, combat phase one, it's one move on your side, unless there's something that changes that, like having a surge move where... Essentially, it's like, uh, I believe it's Rush out of... Oh, well, actually, it's not even Rush out of Hearthstone, because that's a bad example. It's basically, it's a secondary move. You can do something and it doesn't consume... So you're saying combat phase? I think action phase is maybe more yeah. appropriate. Because you can do combat, but you can also play cards or use uh, abilities that your heroes have. Or perhaps other cards have abilities. Well, well all, some well, cards, all cards, cards have, have the ability to block... Uh, basically, take on the uh, or force the enemy to attack them uh, once. And something else that's interesting is that special abilities 
only fire once. So flying is a, a probably the biggest example of this, where in Magic the Gathering, if you have a flying deck and you come up against somebody that can't deal with flying creatures for some reason, you won. In this, whenever you do an action phase and do anything with that that would exhaust that creature, like uh, use them to guard, uh, uh, use them to attack, whatever, they have to rest and they land. So it adds more strategic gameplay to uh, that situation where you have to think out, okay, well, if I do this, this uh, creature is exhausted and it loses its uh, abilities uh, for some things. Uh, the others like uh, block, I, or I keep uh, screwing up block and guard because they're two very similar abil- uh, terms, but they're very different things. One uh, reduces uh, the amount of damage incoming by one, and the other one forces the enemy to attack that creature unless they have a ranged attack. So, th- yeah. So there are some abilities that persist through exhaust, but they seem to be the uh, the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Um. But all of all of this going on that we're talking about, like the way these uh turns and phases and everything play out, you have to approach it very differently than you would Hearthstone. And I ran into this problem when we first started playing, and I'm getting out of this mindset. Because in Hearthstone, what you want to do is you want to optimize your damage every round, or optimize your defense, depending on your play style and who it is that you're playing against. In essence, that's what you're trying to do. And in this, optimizing one of those things at the cost of everything else that you've got going on is not good, because you leave yourself open to attacks. Yeah, I kind of caught you off guard whenever I was going into that, and I think you looked at me like I was a little crazy at first. No, I didn't. I just was like, oh, I oh, I was confused. Because this plays very differently, like we said. And, yeah. Uh, from uh, just... Well, also, that doesn't even counter into the, uh, the fate meter and the uh, threat meter. So there's two other systems at play as well throughout all this. There's fate that uh, all the encounters in this game are, uh, well, I shouldn't say all because a couple of them are not. Most of the encounters in this game are through multiple boards or, or multiple locations. So you're playing essentially th- uh, three to five different games all strung together by a single, actually pretty well done narrative. The uh, the storyline takes place between The Hobbit, uh, actually closer to The Lord of the Rings, but not quite there, because you run to uh, uh, Gimli, and he's uh, not quite as old as he is in the movies, but he's you know, not a kid either. Right. So, you, and there's also the uh, the Fellowship uh, Hobbits as well. They look a little younger, but not terribly so. So, probably 10, 15 years before Lord of the Rings, just to hazard a guess. So yeah, I'm not as clear on the uh, Lord of the Rings timeline, the Middle Earth timeline, as I am some other series. Yeah, uh, well, I'm just guesstimating based on uh, some of the things I saw. So as you progress through these encounters, one, your board cha- uh, stays the same. So all your uh, heroes and uh, everything, all your equipment, which you're able to equip uh, different uh, units with. Uh, a sword, uh, well, essentially a weapon, a defensive item, an enchantment, and one other thing that I'm blanking on. Yeah, there's four things, but I don't know what... I don't remember what the fourth one is, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's weapon, shield, or defensive item, usually a shield. Yeah, but there is armor as well. Enchantment. Maybe it's like a magical effect or maybe, something. Uh, maybe. Well, that's enchantment, so uh, maybe it's just like a, a, a an accessory. Yeah. But anyway... All that stays the same, as well as the health of your creatures uh, throughout your adventure. But as you progress through, you essentially draw more attention to yourself. uh, Through, uh, first of all, just your heroes being there. You know, uh, this little fellowship forming draws uh, some threat. And uh, the stronger the hero uh, character, the more initial threat that they generate usually somewhere in the ballpark of 9 to 12. Uh, With three heroes, yeah, you're dealing uh, upper 20s, lower 30s. So every 
uh, <clears throat> so often, there's a tick mark on this threat meter that builds up. And environmental things happen. You may just take some damage. You may uh, not draw cards your next upkeep. Uh, you may have other enemies summon in. And it all depends on the adventure you're going on. You're going on these little, yeah, uh, these little quests. I don't want to spoil the beginning of the story because it's kind of interesting just going through the tutorial as well of uh, just different things happening. But on the counter side of it, uh, you could use your willpower to fill up the fate meter to be able to have things happen in your favor. You may find uh, a pack of supplies. You may uh, uh, draw some extra cards. You may uh, summon in another hero character. And it adds uh, even more strategic choice to the game that I hadn't really found at other places. Yeah, and the effects of the fate uh, meter, the fate uh, things you can do, vary pretty wildly. They can heal you. There's typically one, or it seems to be there's one that's sort of location specific or your particular like point in the quest specific. Yeah, like, yeah essentially... Um... Uh, if you're going through three to five locations, like location A may have one uh, uh, that's location specific. Location B may have one that's location specific. That, that sort of thing. And it changes out. So you have to constantly dump this willpower in. But, to, but the rest of them are shared. Yeah. And when they're gone, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So they provide interesting strategic um, possibilities. So it's the voice acting. It, I, all of the cut scenes the narrative uh, they're not really cut scenes all of the narrative parts where you're getting the story through line they're all narrated they've got excellent oh they have an amazing art. golem they do but they've got really good original art um at least as far as i know i've never seen this art anywhere before but i i'm sure the temptation was there to use a lot of the stuff that's been created for the movies and yeah well that familiarity that pop culture yeah well even uh, modern pop culture has even the well-known characters uh, there are alternate uh, art, but they still don't look exactly like the uh, uh, the movies. There, there's resemblance. You can tell it's the same character, uh, but that's just because it's that character. It's not, yeah, uh, this is definitely, yeah, this actor. This is definitely that actor. No, not really. Yeah, which I'm glad. Like, I mean, they could have. It would have been easy, and I'm sure they could have gotten away with it. But um, I think the first Lord of the Rings movie... That, that we think of, because there's were older movies that have been made and a lot of other productions, but and, and there's, what there's we also think of cartoon. as the Lord of the Rings... Do there's I, also the cartoon. Yeah. But what we think of as Lord of the Rings came out in, I believe, like 2001 or 2002, the first movie. Yeah, 2001 for Fellowship, 02 for Two Towers. Yeah, the Peter Jackson. And then 03 for Return of the King. Yeah, the Peter Jackson movies. And then The Hobbit was more recent, but still something like five years ago, so... Those movies are quite old at this point, um, and it's good to see that they're, they've they taken a, a fresh, new approach to it. But it's all very well done. Good voice acting, good art. Um, uh, a nice change of pace for up. just uh, the CCG, uh, really, in general. Uh, I didn't see any microtransactions at all, not counting DLC, which uh, both the uh, PlayStation... Uh, oh, sorry... Game Pass, the Xbox Game Pass. I, I need to just put away my controller so I stop looking at the PlayStation controller. Uh, uh, the Game Pass and the uh, Steam version, they're both the Definitive Edition, so they have all the DLC packs already included in them. Uh, yeah, uh, and those were just additional campaigns yeah, and these, to play. Yeah, and there, and there is an unlock system, but the way it works is that as you progress through storylines you get fellowship points that you could use to craft cards or get alternate art. But you could also go back and replay, and you get bonuses for when playing co-op, which also does increase the difficulty somewhat. Uh, you get uh, you get bonuses for playing as different hero characters. So every time you do a, a new hero, you get 500 fellowship points there. Uh, there are secondary objectives that you get uh, that... Uh, can vary wildly in difficulty uh, from just, you know, pretty simple, you know, you're going to do that anyway, to pretty fucking difficult. Uh, uh, like keeping your characters at above 50% for one, but then also keeping this one particular character alive 
uh, may be another one. Yeah, maybe it's like a bonus character you get as part of the mission if you do something. It's like, all right, so you have to get that character, and then you have to keep them alive. And so, you know, but they're not as strong as the main hero, so maybe you, in order to complete that challenge on a on a run, you have to really focus some resources that you, that you would have funneled elsewhere. Like, it's a really good system. Um, but it, I don't know if you also, get bonuses for beating on the higher difficulties. I don't do think you know so. you get a bonus for that? Okay. I think that one's just for uh, bragging rights, at least as far as I can tell. Uh, but uh, I never felt like I was being restrained or, yeah, you know, forced to go grinding. Because you get fellowship points pretty easily. And uh, each you could only have two of the same card in the uh, 30 uh, card deck. Not counting uh, hero cards, which you could only have one of. And there's also a couple others that you could only have one summit at a time, but you could have two in the deck. Yeah, like special named characters. Uh So, overall, three thumbs up. Uh, I would say four. 100% recommend. Four, both of us. I mean, if if you're someone who's listening who's got Game Pass and you even remotely care about these types of games, like definitely download it and check and it out. And definitely if you're a, a fan of uh, Lord of the Rings lore, because there's a uh, little uh, yeah, fun things. Uh, all of the cards have a little snippet of the of the novels, or some of the supplemental lore. Uh, but then there's a little, like, end jokes. Like, Bill the Pony uh, is a very powerful card, but he becomes very unhelpful if you're using Sam as a hero character. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, very, very good. Very good stuff. But uh, I think it's worth 20 bucks, Even what I played so far, like 100% worth 20 bucks to get all the campaign. And they're long, too. I mean, we, we got through, like, a campaign, quote-unquote, is five... Five sets of missions. missions yeah. Five sets of missions. And, each, and we and got each through... Is, the, uh, usual, like I said, three to five. And they're pretty yeah. long. And even more so in uh, co-op, because you're saying they're you know, uh, coordinating things. Yeah, we got through t- two of them in like an hour and a half to two hours, something like that. I think we could speed it up, especially now that I'm a little more familiar with the game. But I mean, I think that it would still take you a good four, three, four hours to get through a single campaign. And that's just one run through, not counting if, you know, you like it and you want to go back and get the challenges, get um, as many of the the coins as you can to unlock cards and stuff like that so then you get three of those and then there are some one-off at least i think they're one-offs i haven't played them but they look like sort of challenges um so uh, there's a good chunk of content here for the money that you pay for it so yeah like you said four thumbs up not just two four thumbs up would recommend totally buy um yeah so that brings me to my last game on the list, which is XCOM 2. Uh, I hadn't played XCOM 2 in like two years. Um, but this is in the the list of like turn-based games that I can play while also working and not really have to worry about it. Um, I do not have the War of the Chosen DLC. I wish I did. Um, there's a most of the mods at this point. Uh, you have to have War of the Chosen for them to work. Uh, so that sucks. Kind of the, the mainstay XCOM mod, which is the Long War mod, has got a version that supports both the vanilla version of the game and the War of the Chosen version. Also, damn, they're still charging full price for this. Yes, they are. They are indeed. Um, so, but I, I mean, I'm playing it with the War of the Chosen mod. I just jumped straight back into it. And XCOM 2 is a lovely, wonderful turn-based experience game um, that adds a ton to the original XCOM. Although, I gotta gotta level with you, I have no clue what's the Long War versus what's just in the base game uh, at this point. Because I hadn't played it in two years, jumped straight back in with the Long War mod, um, started a new game, and away I went. And the Long War adds a lot of stuff. I know that there are some weapons that are added, like some additional weapon stuff that has been added that wasn't in the original, and like a huge revamp of the skill system. And I know that the commander's choice, which lets you choose what your soldiers, once they level up from rookies to squaddies, lets you choose what um, specialization they are. 
but otherwise I got no clue which is which. So if I talk about something and you you know you're like that's not in the original XCOM, my apologies. Um, so the War of the Chosen or War of the Chosen, God, the Long War mod essentially makes the game as it implies a lot longer. You get way more missions. Um, it takes a lot longer to build up resources, uh, to collect the things that you need for science. It slows down the progression on like the main bad guy project that if they complete, you fail or you lose. Um, it slows that down and, uh, basically makes everything a lot tougher. It adds a great deal of variance to the stats that your soldiers can have. It adds variance to the enemies that appear. I do know that in the base game, there's basically only one or two types of every enemy, kind of an early game version and then a later game version for when you're powered up so that they still make sense. But um, the Long War mod adds a bunch of different variants along the way. So even the basic troopers start to get variants with more health and different armor color and upgraded weapons and things like that as you go along. Um, and the game never really lets up. Like I... Maybe at some point in the late game, the Long War mod, which I've never beat XCOM 2 with the Long War mod. So I don't know how the end game plays out with the that mod turned on. But it really never feels like it lets up. In the base version, kind of once you get towards the end of the game where everybody's got like plasma weapons and jetpack armor and that kind of stuff, everything kind of becomes easy breezy. Um, but in Long War, you essentially you're always in like a, an arms race with the enemy because they upgrade as well as you do. So early on you get some quick advancements in tech that level the playing field and then they get stronger. But then finally you get a couple of squads of, of people who have got a high enough um, or who have ranked up enough times that they have enough abilities and health to compete. And then they introduce stronger enemies and then you try and race down the tech and get more squads of more people who are, and it's just like this never ending like arms race that adds a lot of complexity and really builds up the like, oh shit, I'm going to squad wipe this factor whenever you lose one or God help you a whole squad of people who are, have ranked up several times and have good equipment and all that shit's just gone. Which in the early game that can completely ruin a playthrough. I think I'm, I'm far enough along now that if I do have a squad wipe, I will be okay. But. You can retreat if things go against you. Your um your support yells at you and you lose stuff for a month, which can suck itself, but it's definitely more important to keep your guys alive almost all the time. So um I've just I, I mean I've enjoyed it. My computer used to have some problems in certain areas of the game, but now with my hardware upgrade, I don't really seem to have any issues. Occasionally I'll hit something where it'll chug when I think it's like doing a lot of like smoke effects and stuff. Um, in the early game, sort of the optimal way to play is to just level everything with rockets and grenades. And so you get a lot of fires and crumbly rumble and sm or rumble, rubble and smoke and stuff. And so that can cause some issues, but that only happens every so often. Um, in general, it's a really good experience that I think I would recommend everybody go back and play. It's certainly been helping me, uh, can pour a lot of anxiety and, um, negative emotion into it uh and it helps me to feel good when it's like yeah so and so got that crit and saved the rest of my team and i'm basing all of my characters all of my soldiers off of either people that i i know through the podcast or clients that i have oh no so i try to match their this their specialty to their personality as well as like get the appearance kind of as close as you can i mean even with quite a few mods that add um more facial more faces and variety and stuff it's you know that's kind of a hard thing to match Do up. i even want to know what but, my character's like um your character is a um shinobi which are the the people that use um close range weapons and melee weapons and you're kind of a scraggly Dark skinned, but like not a not a black person, but just more like a dark skinned type of person with scraggly hair, and um, you kill people with throwing axes most of the time. Do I cook them? <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. You cook the aliens. Okay, head cannon. I, I yeah, thought you said I you. use uh, axes, not hand, uh, head cannons. <laughs> Touche. Um, 
but yeah, so I try to try to base them off of people that I know and clients that I have. And that's been good. That got a good laugh. I've sent some screenshots of, of characters to people and there's one in particular. I'm very excited to send her what her character is. Um, so it's, it's going to be good. I can't wait to get her response. But the uh, the nicknames don't always necessarily make sense. Like for some of them, it's easy. Like I've got your name because I know your actual name. And then your nickname is is Rage. Mm-hmm. But then some other people, it's like, well, like I know that this person's name is... Well, no, that doesn't really work either because I know like Ghost Shark and Cube, like I know their actual names. So that would work for, that works for their nicknames. But for like my clients, especially, it's like, well, they don't really have nicknames. Like I know their names, but they don't have nicknames. So I've been trying to come up with nicknames for my clients Uh-oh. too. <laughs> so that one's been kind of hit or miss. Like the people I've told, I'm like, yeah, and your nickname is this. And they're like, oh, I don't like that. And I'm like, oh, that's just what the game randomly generated. I can change it. What What do you think would be better? <laughs> it's like, whew, saved on that <laughs> one. But Yeah, it turns out uh, the game generates Cray Cray a lot. Actually, the game generates a, has generated a few good ones. Like, um, there was a, a person that I created, and they're a, they're a trans person. And um, it gave them the nickname Rainbow, <laughs> which could have gone, like, someone could take that offensively, 100%. But they're the sort of person that they loved it when I told them. They were like, oh, that's hilarious. I love that. You have to keep it. So, it can do good sometimes. Here I used to just murder people in RimWorld. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. You need to go back and uh, get the DLC for RimWorld now that I think about it. Oh, well, uh, Summer Tail Cell is uh, just around the corner. Yeah, um, I need to. I haven't actually went to see what the historical low for the War of the Chosen DLC is, but I mean, I want to get it. I just don't want to pay like forty bucks for it. So, you know. But anyway, so yeah, that does it for games that we played this uh, week. Hang on, hang on. Um, Let's see, historical low is still thirteen bucks. Yeah, I mean, I'd totally pay thirteen bucks for basically a new game because um, War of the Chosen added and changed so much to the game. Oh, uh, wait, correction. Uh, looks like War of the Chosen hit 10 on Amazon at one point. Sweet. Um, but yeah, so games we played this week, which leads us... Uh, actually, uh, uh, I may have just cost you money. Why? War of the Chosen, 71% off on uh, GOG. But I've got it on Steam. Oh, sorry, Green, uh, Green Man Gaming. And... Oh. And it's a Steam key. Yep, you probably just cost me $11. money. $11.61. Oh, yeah, I would 100%. We'll pay that for it. The only thing is, is that I would basically have to abandon my current playthrough and start a new one because I, I've got all the mods and everything for the base base game, and I'm I've I've invested already <laughs> like twenty hours into that that playthrough. Uh, I have so many well, good, well, good soldier go ahead, boys and girls. I do it for the next playthrough. I suppose I could. Yeah, actually, XCOM two right now is seventy eight percent off. It's down to sixteen fifty on there. War of the Chosen. All right. I said War of the Chosen, please. What are you doing? War of the Chosen. Search. Go. There we go. Got it. I'm going to... I'll buy this later. <laughs> no, you'll buy right it now, now go, mister. We, right now, we need to go do the news. So, our first news topic of the night. Um, ES, the ESRB finally labels loot boxes, sort of. Yeah, so... Uh, our never-ending <laughs> battle on the ESRB, I guess, huh? Yeah. Uh, so, it's been, what, about a year uh, since the they announced that they were putting in-game purchases in, uh, uh, well, on uh, games. Yeah, although it feels like, I don't know, 10,000 lifetimes at this point. Oh, oh, yeah, well, that's just the corona. It, it has a time dilation. <laughs> Among other it, things. It has a time dilation effect. It also uh, makes people... Uh, create sourdough starters <laughs> indeed it does but anyway you know after the fact that you know loot boxes are kind of on their way out thankfully because ea uh the esrb is putting a new label on games in-game purchases includes random items in parentheses to as a designation for loot boxes i mean i mean this just feels like more obfuscation really yeah it's still fairly nondescript it it is like a teensy bit more information than their first thing um 
but it's still not really a lot of information, especially to someone who, in our, our example, we always go to is like a parent who doesn't really know anything about video games. But, you know, to anyone who doesn't know what that means, really, it doesn't really give you any additional information without going and looking it up. Yeah, honestly, it just uh, makes it even more obfuscated because it includes random items. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, well, even well, it's is better than what it was before because it was in-game purchases, which was pretty much, I would say, 99% of uh, modern AAA titles because it was any in-game purchase, be it cosmetics, expansions, DLC, or, uh, co- or loot boxes. So now loot boxes has their own, includes random items. Honestly, I would much rather see them name loot boxes or gotcha mechanics or however you want to uh, break it down, but also yeah. have other labels for this as well. In-game purchases, cosmetics. In-game purchases, content. In-game purchases, uh, time skips. That sort of thing. Yeah. In-game purchases, XP boost, or currency. Bo- yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess those would fall under time skips, though. Possibly. Or, or yeah, uh, accelerated uh, 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 progression. That sort yeah. of thing. I know, I know it's a pipe sounds... dream. I mean, we're still finding them to get loot boxes properly labeled, let alone the other, the other things that are that are kind of uh, shady at best. Yeah, kind of like a digital equivalent of food labels or nutritional labels. Yeah, right now uh, we're up to Taco Bell where they list spices, <laughs> meat product, mechanically separated meat product. Contains up to 40% meat. Well, uh, at least it's better than Subway, where they found everything was, uh, what was it, uh, everything was turkey, or everything was chicken? Yeah, I think it was turkey. Everything had, like, bits of turkey in it or something like that. But, yeah, I, I mean, you're right, it's a pipe dream, but man, it would be nice to actually have clear, easy-to-understand information on what was in the games that you buy. Yeah. Those would be the days, huh? Yeah. I think that's one of those things that would be useful for everybody. Someone who doesn't know very much or anything at all about games, you get some clear, easy phrasing, and you might still have to go look something up, but you get a clear, easy phrase to search. Um, and then for us, people who are who are like us can look at something and just see, like, oh, it contains this. Well, I'm not interested, or, you know, okay, that's not like a red flag, so maybe I'll I'll buy this or go to look up some more information on it. But I mean it would be a good it would be a good way to save time and more easily categorize information. Yeah, but what's uh annoying is that uh it doesn't really keep up with the games either because we've seen games patch in entire storefronts and loot boxes post launch. So it has to be reevaluated by the ESRB if they you know want to enforce that. So that's not even really uh, all that useful because some companies just step around it in other ways. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, you know, we have other companies just doubling down on uh, the gambling aspect. I mean, we have GTA putting in a full casino. I actually got an email this past week from Atari talking about the Atari Casino, uh, where it's even worse than the uh, than the GTA one. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't. Uh. They actually let you gamble cryptocurrency. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, I'm dumping I, it in. I mean, cryptocurrency is legit real currency. Because, yeah. I mean, you don't even have to... A lot of sites will just accept cryptocurrency as a form of payment. I mean, damn. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm pretty sure this was in a, a late uh, uh, April Fool's, right? I mean, I, yeah, I didn't hear anything about it, but. I mean, I just got this uh, a couple days ago, so. Whew, right? So, yeah. while some companies are backing away, others are just doubling down and really makes it so that the ESRB is just, you know, not keeping up. Yeah. And it's a lot to keep up on. For even initial releases would be a lot to keep up on, let alone coming to go back and check everyone whenever they do make big changes to games like that and reevaluating them. I mean, I'm not, I'm not giving them a, like a free pass or anything, but I'm sure there are people there who do genuinely care and want to do a good job. But you know, I would say this is probably the system working as intended. 
Okay, here's the site. I'm looking at this. I don't see uh, 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 this being satire. Unless I'm just, yeah, missing something, right? Yeah. No, I don't. So, yeah. <laughs> That's a thing. You thought I was joking. No, I didn't think you were joking. I just didn't know. I just was shocked, I guess. I don't know. Maybe they think cryptocurrency isn't real, real currency. I mean, it's not, what's the term? Fiat currency? Um, I mean, it, it, okay, so it's not a government backed currency, yeah. but you can use it directly to buy stuff. That makes it money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is going to be interesting in the coming weeks, huh? Uh, as yeah. this goes online. I mean, they're even doing a pre sale on the, uh, on the Atari tokens. What's the pre order? So they accept Bitcoin and Eternium. Okay, so. Yep. Their first pr- uh, couple pre sales are eight cents, I guess, per token. Then it jumps up to 20, then price to be announced in May 2020, and then summer 2020 is another sale. I mean, are they making another cryptocurrency as well, essentially? Maybe. It depends on who can get that currency, and can it be sold secondhand or traded secondhand. But Ethereum was like a one of Bitcoin's biggest competitors for a while. I don't know. I got into crypto mining for a little bit, and then I've dropped off. And haven't really spent too much time on it. Because once the crypto market, uh, not crashed, but mm-hmm. plummeted, I kind of lost my interest in it as a hobby. I mean, I was never expecting to get rich or anything like that. But, you know, the idea of like, oh, yeah, I use this to make a few bucks on the side and like trade it. But then once it kind of died down, I was like, nah, it's not worth my, it's not worth the electricity to do it, essentially. But who knows? I might get back into it a little bit now that I'm starting to build up a, small surplus of computer components just do it again for the hell of it but yeah so back to the actual news topic, i guess though. so <laughs> because esrb like one percent more helpful than than you were before yeah unfortunately it's a scale of a thousand yeah i, I was so just saying that, our... that they're not keeping up with just how fast things are changing and that I think requires a you know, a complete change on how ESRB handles games, and honestly, I don't think they're going to do that. Yeah, I don't think so either. Not until they're made or taken out of the equation, essentially. But um, you know, good luck with that in America, anyways. Um, yeah. So our next news topic: um, Sony is announcing the Play at Home initiative. Which is pretty neat. Um, basically, uh, to try and promote people to, or encourage people, help people, and also, let's be honest here, give themselves some good publicity, some good PR. Uh, they're giving two games to everybody who owns a PlayStation. Is it a PS4? Or are these games that can be played on PS3 and PS4? I'm just going to assume PlayStation 4 because I don't see... Uh, to support play at home, PlayStation will try to make those occasionally dull moments more exciting by offering Uncharted, the Nathan Drake Collection, and Journey available for free for a limited time through digital downloads. So it sounds like uh, PlayStation 4. Okay. Yeah, so if you've got a PS4, you can get these two games for free. Um, Sony has got PlayStation Plus, and if you subscribe to PlayStation Plus, you do get several games for free every month and it's varied i don't know what it is now but it's been two it's been three it's been four um you know over time but this doesn't require that just if you have a playstation 4 you can log in um quote buy the games or add them to your account and then download at your leisure to play which is pretty cool i don't you know i don't yeah we've seen, a lot of companies yeah, we've seen a few companies doing this um uh, ubisoft uh, gave away a yeah, another Assassin's Creed game. Uh, seen a yeah. few pop up on Steam lately, so we have had quite a few, uh, you know, gestures of goodwill. But the more interesting one, I would say, is the creative funding. So they're trying to help independent developers by earmarking ten million dollars to support independent development partners. So uh, creating a fund to help those who are having. Trouble in these rather crazy times, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind yeah. of a nice little feel-good article considering all the shit that's going down. Or, I guess, press release in this case. Yeah. 
I, I mean, that, I mean, I mean I, technically they're giving away four games because it's the Nathan Drake collection. So it's yeah, Uncharted, Uncharted Two, and Uncharted Three, which are the remastered PS4 version. So yeah, it's PlayStation Four only. So it's yeah, a, a fairly decent assortment if you like that sort of game, of course, and something to keep you busy, right? Yeah, which I think is a good thing all around. Um, you know, I don't care if it's even if they're doing it purely for PR purposes. You know, that fact it's still helping people, and right now I think that's more important to me than looking at these level of motivations at least you know there's a point where it's like okay you really need to quit your shenanigans but just like hey we're gonna have some good pr and give people some games like yeah that's fine you can have your good pr that's a, a trade i'm willing to to make oh uh, essentially here's something interesting in germany and china users will have knack 2 and journey uh for free instead of uh, the nathan Drake collection i'm guessing that uh, the nathan Drake collection is banned there so hey, they get knack too. Has it uh, has it China suffered enough? <laughs> oh yes, indeed they have. Uh, but it's more. Uh, I, I like that they're. I, I know ten million dollars to Sony isn't a lot. Yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure that's what the CEO, you know, it has in his couch. Uh, well, maybe not these days because Sony uh, as a whole has been. Uh, uh, struggling. It's just that certain departments are doing well enough to keep things afloat. But the uh, saying some aside for their indie development partners is a very uh, good gesture as well. And something I wanted to make sure that we got across that you know uh, they they are trying to help out the indies. They are indeed, which is good for them. Good job. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a lot more to say about this. It's just a nice. Happy, fresh little news story. Yeah, so let's go to something that just boils my piss. <laughs> yep. Uh, Nintendo Switch it. scalpers are using bots to drive up prices. Oh, where to start on this one? So I have a few friends that are actively looking for game consoles. Spe- uh, specifically a Switch. I have a friend, Adidas, looking for one uh, as well. It's, uh, looking for one, and these bot, uh, these uh, well, g- price gougers are using bots to just grab them as soon as they come down in price. And this is not something that we've seen just with switches. We've seen it with uh, toilet paper in the U.S., sanitizer, other things, uh, face masks, and just them reselling and uh, trying to get those stimulus checks. Right. So yeah. Right now, a switch is hovering between uh, four hundred fifty to five hundred dollars, according to the article, with some highs as high as six hundred a week ago. So let's just go over to Amazon and look. While you're while we're going to Amazon to look, also I know Jim from our um, community, Jim thirty five thirty five, was looking for one recently. He wound up bought getting one. That wasn't at scalper prices, but I remember him talking about that a little bit uh, a few weeks ago when he was looking for one. Like he couldn't find one that was, you know, inexpensive or even like properly okay. priced for a while. Well, Nintendo uh, Switch with neon blue and neon red Joy Cons with Mario Kart Eight Deluxe, six hundred thirty-five dollars on the cheapest. But hey, it includes free shipping. Oh, how nice of the fuckers. Um, okay, just the switch. Uh, by used, $532 with, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just damn, right? Uh, switch lights, uh, $278, so not as bad, but still a used item. And they even have the doll to say MSRB on here, $199, right? Yeah eBay is no better. Um, looks like the new stuff is being inflated to four, five, six hundred dollars $600. If you want to buy a Ninten- an Animal Crossing New Horizons brand new special Switch console, it's 700 bucks on eBay. The used listings, it looks like, are a little bit better, especially if you get like true used listings where the people have taken pictures of like all their stuff sitting out on a table instead of like a box. That just says like refurbished or used or whatever. Um, 
then that's more in line with what you would expect. Anywhere from 150 to 300 and like, you know, the stuff that's like 300, they've got like games and a travel case and stuff like that. So, you know, possibly on eBay you could get something. But I mean, if you wanted to buy one that was brand new or if you wanted to definitely get free reliable shipping through a seller like Amazon that's not guaranteed when you buy from an individual on eBay, like your SOL. I mean, how even the Joy-Cons themselves are up a good 20, 30 bucks uh, for the left and right uh, combo pack. Not mm-hmm. terrible, but damn. I'm just going through, uh, oh boy, this is going to be an expensive one. One with uh, Pikachu and Eevee. Uh, uh, let's go Pokemon. $611. No, thank you. Probably won't be getting a Switch this year at this rate. Maybe I'll get the VR headset at the end of the year instead. I'm just kind of just scrolling through. Uh, uh, here's the old uh, original version of the Switch with the uh, more defective Joy-Cons. Mm-hmm. $643, right? Wrong. Um, and no, thank you. I mean, just, oh, wow. I knew they were overpriced, but damn. Practically double the price now? Yeah. Not worth it, I don't think. I mean, I've used a Switch. I've played the Switch. I know several people who have them. Basically, everybody in my D&D group has a Switch, and they talk about it all the time. I mean, they're they're good little consoles. They can do a lot. Whenever you get one at the appropriate price, they're certainly worth it. But I'm not paying, you know, effectively another gaming PC price for a Nintendo Switch. Anyone out there in the audience who's like, how the hell could you buy, build a gaming PC for six or $700? I have. I could do it. I, I could give you, give you, you could get a really good gaming PC for that much money. Hell, uh, even, whenever, not even having to go second hand. Hell, whenever I was, uh, you know, having my initial audio issue, I quickly started looking at, uh, builds. And for five, six hundred dollars, I could build one hell of a PC these days. To, yeah. And the RAM prices have uh, come way down. Yeah. At least for now. It's just, uh, pe- uh, people, th- there's, always going to be the people that kind of ruin that good feel you know yeah yeah and uh, take advantage but damn people suck assholes are assholes mm-hmm. so yeah all right but what is hilarious is somebody actually built their own switch there's a there was a reddit thread of them ordering all the parts and building it themselves it takes some uh, t- uh technical know-how but they actually built it for under the MSRB as well. Nice. Yeah, it's uh, linked in that article that's uh, going to be in the show notes. So if you want to see someone building a, a switch uh, in a cave with a box of scraps, uh, they, they built it in January 2020. Uh, and it was between 175 and 225 depending on uh, uh, eBay averages. Uh, they mm-hmm. used uh, Their used parts was 199 eBay average right now is 300 to 400 Still cheaper, right? Yeah. Still cheaper. And honestly, I think a lot of that is the Joy-Cons because they are using, looks like official Joy-Cons. Let's see. I'm just seeing what the big price is. Uh, They are using an OEM switch replacement logic board, which is $95. So that's one of the big ones. Uh, they're using the replacement battery, uh, replacement sh- uh, casing as well. So, yeah, it's quite amazing. If you have some electrical know-how, you can build one of these damn things yourself. And what's kind of funny is there's people talking about how nobody has time for that. Oh, no, everybody's under quarantine now, so maybe you do. Everybody's got time for that right now. I know what I'm going to spend my $7 on on eBay. What? I need a new I need a new soldering iron, so I'll put that $7 towards a soldering iron. I don't think I would trust a soldering iron for $7, but, I mean, that would be a decent little discount on a decent one. a soldering iron. Yeah, on a on a decent one. I've just got like a shitty like twenty five dollar Amazon special soldering iron and it has like no temperature control. It's like on and off and that's it. It's big and unwieldy. But yeah, give me a soldering iron. I'll I'll look up um some of that later. But thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Costing me more money tonight. Well I've already cost you eleven bucks, so what the hell at this point? Yeah, I, I bought it. I bought it. I told Steam to not download it right now, but I bought it. Well, I just well, I right. found a uh, on the thrifting site. Uh, showed you t- 
uh, there's a soldering gun on there. Uh, in in case with accessories. I have no idea how good it is, but you can go look it up. I'll do that later, maybe tomorrow. Um, yeah. So our next to last news article for the night: um, Valve Patent Steam Controller with Swappable Parts. So, uh, looks like the story about uh, Steam being out of the hardware uh, uh, race has been greatly exaggerated. It was a tactical retreat. They are, well, if the patent uh, pans out, because we see patents for a lot of things, uh, a producing a new version of the Steam Controller, which will have, uh, looks like the left thumbstick uh, to be swappable with D, uh, with a couple of D-pads and also have uh, other parts that you could snap onto it. Mm-hmm. Which, um, looking at that made me just think, like, well, this is a worse version of the Elite Controller. But then you and a worse version of the accessibility controller, but it's an interesting combination of the two, because the it, it, we have no idea how much it costs. Your is going to cost. This is just a patent, and it, how much it would cost if it actually goes through and gets made. Because even if they patent it, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make it. But um, you know, it it could come in there and be an, another high quality option, hopefully cheaper in price than both of Microsoft's offerings because the elite controller is like 150 or something dollars for like the base version and there's different levels with more amounts of sort of customization available to it which all the way at like sort of the top level of the xbox elite controller you can customize everything buttons triggers joysticks and configuration on them and also stuff like how much resistance they have or what types of materials they're made out of to give you a different feel or a different whatever you know and this doesn't look like that and then the Microsoft's, I forget what it's called, but their accessibility controller, which can be programmed and has a bunch of different button attachments and accessories and stuff, is really big and kind of unwieldy. I mean, obviously, if you're someone who has a disability and uses it to be able to play games, like I'm not knocking it for that. But maybe if you're someone who you know doesn't have massive um, disabilities, like I don't know, difficulty with fine motor control or something, but maybe you're just missing some fingers or something. Um, You know, maybe this sort of intermediate option could be really good. So, I mean, we don't really know enough yet to do much beyond speculate, but it's interesting to see them kind of enter into this market where there's not, to my knowledge, a lot that exists outside of like hardcore people who build their own custom stuff. Oh, sorry. I was uh, kind of zoning out there for a moment. (laughs) No, you're good. Yeah, what's going to be interesting is uh, how this also ties into just how flexible the original Steam controller was, uh, assuming we see this, of course, because we saw some pretty crazy uh, accessibility and uh, crazy applications with the Steam controller. Because remember, it's one of those things that has a high learning curve. It has uh, that hurdle to get over, but those people that got it to work for them, uh, swore by it. So having essentially more custom, uh, custom ability of it and be able to maybe swap out for uh, certain games. Well, it'll be an interesting thing to see how it pans out. Assuming we of course see it at some point, because I remember seeing people playing shooters with it and being, not quite as good as a mouse and keyboard, but honestly being a lot better than, you know, most controller gameplay I've seen, especially playing on PC versions where you don't really have a lot, if any, aim assist. Uh, I've uh, seen just, you know, uh, I remember when the uh, controller was originally coming out, uh, seeing them show off Portal and ha- having uh, some of the uh, different uh, configurations for it. So it'll be... A, a fun experience to see how this handles. And, well, in our pre-podcast talk, it's kind of a, uh, a shock that we haven't seen more controllers really latch onto this uh, modulability of uh, just swapping out different components or small components for uh, one uh, for one another uh, control types. Swapping a thumbstick for another D-pad, for example. Yeah. I mean, I assume it's just cost, even if it's only, you know, 20 cents per unit to create the parts that allow you to do that. You make 
10 million controllers, you know, you may, or 20 or, you know, whatever. And suddenly that cost skyrockets, you know, to millions of dollars that you don't want to in, invest. Yeah, true. But it's also kind of a chicken and egg thing. Yeah, we don't know if there's a market for it because we don't really see a lot of accessibly priced controllers with it. Because, like you said, the Elite Controller has it, or or a, a version of this, but it's also, what, $150 for the entry version? Yeah, something like that. And I'm so. uh, thinking two things uh, when it comes to that. Fuck and that. Honestly, I kind of get it. It's not for me. But, I mean, think about, you know, I think about, like, the keyboard and mouse that I use as my input device. I mean, combined together. Yeah, true. They were about $115, $120 when I bought them at the time. You know, I mean, you want, if if you, you know, are serious about the thing that you do, you want to get something that's high quality. I mean, I don't recommend anybody just go blow shitloads of money on something that they don't need or but, for needless, but, but like, R- told them RGB. But Ninja told them they could win a chicken dinner if they uh, got, uh, you know, the elite controller, right? Yeah, but Ninja's a shithead. So <laughs> well, well, I know you um, would. But um, you know, if if you want something more and it suits your needs, then you know, I I don't have a problem with people paying for that, and I get it. But you know, for me, a hundred and fifty dollar controller is like what the what the hell? No, thank you. That was a hundred and fifty dollar hotas. Uh, <laughs> I've got a I've got a two hundred dollar hotas. Thank you very much. So, you know, I get it. 100%, I get it. Just I don't need a controller that is that because I play primarily on keyboard or mouse. And a few things that I do play with a controller, I don't I don't need it to be customizable. So I don't know. Like, I don't... Th- there's always definitely at least some market, some need for accessibility features, for sure. Um, but I don't know from a, a big company perspective, like, if it's worth it to them to do it. I mean, technically, I do have a, a, a customizable controller, but it's all software side, not hardware. So I, I do understand the customer uh, uh, making it your own, you know, but at the same time, whew, right? Yeah. So interesting. We'll see what happens if it actually gets built and released. I mean, as an owner of the original Steam controller that has been sitting for a while, I don't know if I'd be willing to invest in another one. Maybe. Yeah, see, I, but I, maybe I missed not. out on it. I I couldn't justify it, uh, whatever it was on uh, clearance, because I wasn't sure if there would be continued support for it, because it was only you know really supported through Steam itself. And I didn't yep. want to get a hunk of plastic that, you know, the next Steam update, you know, broke it. Yeah. Plus, I'm pretty happy with uh, my uh, uh, PlayStation 4 controller. I got a lot more use out of the Steam Link than I did the steam controller i don't use the steam link quite so much anymore now that i've got a media center in my office but for a long time i would go in my living room and use the steam link and play games on my tv in there but you know i don't really need to do that anymore so the steam link also is gathering dust yeah i need to hook up the steam link actually since uh the tv's no longer right there it would be a lot easier especially for Something like Cuphead. Introduce an eater to some pain, right? <laughs> yeah. I just picked up my Steam controller off of my desk. Disturbed uh, the layer you... of dust? Yeah. Serious question. Do you want it? Oh, sure. I think, I think I've still got the original box <laughs> and everything for it. I mean, if you're shipping it to me, sure. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. I'll, ha- I'll have to make sure I've still got the dongle and everything and I haven't lost that. I think I do, but... Yeah, I mean, this thing literally is collecting dust. I literally, I just wiped a layer of dust off the top of it, so <laughs> I'll set that right there. I pres- I think I know where the dongle is. The box and stuff is a little more iffy about where it might be, but I know I've got at least the dongle for it. Um, I think it also has got Bluetooth built in, I think. Yeah, and I do have a Bluetooth but... dongle on my computer. Oh, yeah. you got a dongle. I've got a dongle. Yeah, uh, the dongle gets a little col- uh, smaller when it's cold. <laughs> so yeah I'll I'll find all that shit and mail it to you happy late early birthday yes Christmas I mean it's we're uh, Easter present uh, I guess right? it would be yeah happy happy late Easter <laughs> happy happy early my birthday 
Because uh, uh, my birthday, my are birthday's going, next are, week. Yeah, you're going to the Hobbit or out <laughs> where you're giving others yeah. uh, your birthday. Yeah. Yep. My birthday is next week. Hang on. Let, let's see. What is? Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. This is gonna be fun. April twenty second. Uh, what holidays are ce- or celebrated today? Uh, oh, it's the Christian Feast Day. There you go. Right. It's Discovery Day in Brazil. Oh, it's Earth Day. There you go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy Christian Feast Day. Uh, happy Earth Day. Here, have a pl- piece of plastic that will last forever. Welcome to Earth with this plastic trash. Motherfucker. <laughs> Surprise, motherfucker. Some fraz, motherfucker. All rise, motherfucker. <laughs> Next topic, m- motherfucker. Uh, EA patents matchmaking based on retention rate, motherfucker. I'm... <laughs> it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> well, we won't be on motherfucker as much as... Somebody drops out uh, during a match. That'd be nice. I mean, this is one of the things I'm a little leery whenever EA patents something like this. But at the same time, it's one of those things that, you know, maybe that should be a metric for uh, matchmaking. Uh, So retention rate is essentially how often somebody goes through a match in this case. So uh, if somebody tends to... play their matches to completion or let's just uh use a generic uh, shooter if somebody uh, plays through a uh, uh their uh, all the rounds of a uh, match on a shooter uh they'll have a higher retention rate so that they'd be matched together with uh, or people with higher retention rates would get matched together it seems while those who rage quit more often will just yeah you know, start falling further and further out of the matchmaking or get put together, which will be hilarious. It's sort of like putting the uh, the <laughs> cheaters together, right? Yeah, which I, I like that idea. I mean, I was always someone who, even if we were losing, I would play out a match. Yeah, it would get really frustrating when we when we were playing Rocket League and we'd have a, a random that would just drop. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you could make a comeback, and you come back and win. And even if you didn't, there's still, you know, a lot of times you still get a, a reward for completing. Or I remember in Halo, like, if you quit matches early, like, you had a grace period for a couple to account for, like, a few drop connection in a match or something like that. But quitting games in Halo and Call of Duty and things, like, you didn't get XP. It would hurt your rankings. So. Yeah, I don't like the fact that it's possibly being patented. Uh, at least as a metric. So, yeah, that's something that should, if you're going to use it, it shouldn't be, you know, tied to, uh, just to EA stuff. It should just be uh, a possible way to do it instead of having to deal with patents and all that. But it doesn't sound like a terrible idea. I mean, I've heard a lot worse when it comes to matchmaking lately uh, using patents, right? Yeah. I've heard a lot worse. So this is one of those things that it's like, Huh, why didn't they do that before, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I suspect, I expect that they, in particular EA, are looking for ways to use this to squeeze even more money out of people. Yeah, uh, yeah, if you, uh, yeah, if you, you, uh, you know, buy the pass, uh, it, it skips this metric or something. But also, it shouldn't be a, uh, a one and done metric. It should be, you know, one of multiple things, you know. It should factor in along with ping and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and don't forget all the DLCs that you bought, right? So you can show off your shiny armor to those noobs. Right, 100%. Um, but I could think of it um, working in some other ways, too. Like, oh, excuse me. <coughs> like, like, boring me to death, EA. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, they could try and use it in other ways beyond, like... I don't know, maybe if there's some type of proprietary technology that's involved, I don't see how, but maybe, or, you know, perhaps the actual process is able to be patentable, and so they want to prevent other developers from being able to use that process. And that's where I'm thinking, like, oh, this is tied into some of the type of monetization. Yeah. Because it's, it's crawling through and grabbing some data from somewhere to correlate with this, and then using it to maybe... Because I remember, I guess it was last year the news that there was some type of thing that was matching people up to like essentially show off cosmetics on characters. I don't remember the full details of the story, but it was something really scumming where that EA had this thing in the works that was trying to match people up. Um, 
and like you know they would match like a, a newer player with someone who had like a bunch of cosmetic stuff and you know they were saying like oh yeah you could totally like this is just so that you can be with someone experienced and they can teach you and everyone else is like nah we see what you're doing here you want to try and sell cool cosmetics to the new kids to make them think that they could be good cool players or uh, have it where those that have all the powerful guns that they bought you know i'd be able to snipe the poor noobs right yeah yeah because that's not going to hurt retention of at all for overall gameplay right no nah, definitely not would never do anything to harm the gameplay in the pursuit of the almighty dollar yeah so i guess we finally got through all the news yep we did the news Ooh. EA still sucks. Fuck you, EA. Yeah, I mean, I mean, suck. even whenever there's a good idea, it's one of those things that, uh, how are they going to twist this, right? Because it sounds yeah. like a good idea. Where are you going with this? How are you going to use it to fuck us over? Maybe mm-hmm. we'll if you wish to let us know how you think EA will fuck us over. VGL Podcast at gmail dot com or uh, VGL Podcast on the Twitter. In yeah, because uh, we didn't have anything new actually uh it's been kind of quiet uh i think i highlighted that jim sent me a message a while back saying that uh euro truck sim uh just broke its uh, all-time peak but that's kind of been all over the board lately so and uh, there's just been snark with the uh, cube and that's it so yeah yay snark i know we've got some new listeners this week oh we do we do We're sorry or they they should be they should be new listeners listening this week um, I shared the podcast with a couple of groups of people who are interested in learning. Uh-oh. So if you're out there, Josh or Deshani or anyone else in in your respective groups. Hello. I told you I swore a lot. Yeah, but yeah, he's not the potty mouth one. <laughs> no, I'm the dirty one. You're just the filthy I'm one. The sex, I'm the sex pervert. Oh, spreading your religion That's my again. Thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what I that's what I named my religion when in in Civ 5 when I started playing again with all the expansion stuff and it was like name your religion and I'm like sex perverts. <laughs> sex perverts by the way spread worldwide. Yeah. Uh, getting those missionaries out. Yep. Yep, getting those missionaries out there to show everybody how to do it doggy style. Oh, yeah. But uh, sex perverts is the world religion in my current game. So and I'm not really focusing religion all that much, but I do control uh, a lot of perverts, a large stake in the the world council. So, sex perverts, world religion, yay! Indeed. So, in so I already did the email and the Twitter. Do we want to knock out a quick discovery queue? Yeah, we can do a quick okay, discovery well, queue. I had mine all set. Hang on, I have a good one immediate. Well, not immediately. I did scroll through a couple because. Yeah, right. Right. So you talked about XCOM. Now it's my turn, motherfucker. XCOM okay. Chimera Squad. Oh yeah, I saw this. I was very excited. So when this I saw it. follows one of the endings of XCOM Two, set a few years after the fact. Uh, for more strategic, uh, you know, missing ninety nine percent shot action. It, it, it looks kind of weird because it, it looks like it's not going to be randomized characters it's set characters this time which is strange for XCOM typically you have the cannon well, so, fodder but- <clears throat> that's part of uh, War of the Chosen War of the Chosen has got quite a, it, it introduced factions and you have faction leaders and other characters and stuff that come into play so yeah well uh, uh, like I said it's a bit strange but it's also uh, 50% off on the launch uh, and it's going to be twenty dollars normally, and the and yeah. the launch uh, price lasts beyond the pre-order time, so maybe costing you some more money, right? <laughs> Definitely costing me some more money. I didn't realize that it was coming out so soon. I'm seeing here it's coming out on April twenty fourth. Yeah, it's coming out, which is uh, just over t- or just under two days, Friday. Yep, which is not good because I was going to go through and do our game club game this weekend. But instead, I might be playing this. Uh, do you, do <laughs> no, that's not true. I'll definitely do, you want do to the de- game club. Delay de- game club again? <laughs> no, I'm I'm joking. But yeah, game club should uh, should hopefully not take that long. Yeah, because I haven't even no, touched I'm... it yet. I need to do, uh, do it this weekend. Purchase for myself. Oh, I gotta sign in. Oh, that's that's effort to do right now. I'll do that later. 
Um, I got one though, uh, right away also. Gears Tactics. Uh, I have that preloaded uh, on, Gears... on Game Pass. <laughs> Ready to go. Yeah, I, I also have it, uh, set up to preload. Um, but if you don't have Game Pass, and you're a Gears of War fan who would like to do some, uh, turn based strategy or tactical slash strategy gameplay, um, from what I've seen of this, it looks to be more kind of on XCOM's level of small squad based stuff, um, but, and, and you're completing objectives, but, you know, obviously we'll just have to wait and see when it comes out. But this game releases on the 28th, so next about a week away. Um, well, less than a week actually on the day that this comes out, like three or four days. So, Gears Tactics. So, this one's a bit further out, but my next one on the list was SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. The remaster of. What was it? PlayStation 2 era? Uh, third person platformer? I think so, yeah. PS2. I mean, this is going to be the first time that's on PC, so, you know. Uh, it's $30 normally, uh, has a 10% uh, uh, price reduction for $23, which isn't terrible, actually. But yeah, if you're a SpongeBob fan, there you go, right? I mean, you, I imagine you probably already played the original one, but it looks like it has. Uh, a multiplayer mode now? That was in the original? So, No clue. I've never played it. I'm not a big Spongebob fan. Well, it said new multiplayer, so... Okay, you're up. Yep, um... Zompiercer, which I assume is a play on Snowpiercer. It's a zombie survival game where you have a train. And you drive your train around, and you get... You build it up. And you kill zombies in first person. What's not to love? Trains and zombie killing. Okay. I don't I really have anything else to say, except I'll probably buy oh, this. Oh, I got an interesting one. Receiver 2. So, Receiver was a roguelite where it had one of the more realistic depictions of gunplay, where you manually had to reload the gun, you had to uh, type, a f well, essentially type out how to slide the magazine and uh, swap out the clip and that sort of thing. Well, Receiver 2 seems to be continuing the trend. Receiver 2 simulates every internal part of each firearm based on manufacturer's uh, schematics and gunsmithing resources. <laughs> so, if you want a more realistic, you know, having to load manually all the... Uh, rounds of a revolver and oh and also if you eject the rounds they're gone because you're not going to have time to pick up those unspent rounds uh, it's uh, receiver one was a interesting game so this should be a odd one if you want something a little bit off the wall sweet um i don't know i don't have a new one yet i got distracted yeah. by logging in to actually buy the XCOM thing. Yeah, I'm looking at those. Coming squad. Oh, those are those are breasts exposed for pleasure. What is this? Uh, Sanguine Rose. So I'm not gonna. This isn't gonna be one where I will not put the link. I will put the name, but not the link. Um, it's an erotic visual novel set in a fantasy world. So it this looks fairly like D and D or not D and D. Um, World of Warcraft or Warcraft inspired based on just like the way that the characters are depicted um but a little more emphasis on bare breasts so i guess if you want an erotic visual novel oh, there you go right there you go sing rose well i got a deck builder called one step from edom uh, eden sorry uh, build a powerful deck, cast spells on the fly, battle evolving enemies, and find game-changing artifacts, and make friends or enemies. Just make it to Eden. So it has uh, this odd ba uh, battle grid on it where uh, I'm not sure how you're actually controlling this, if you're uh, controlling just a single character or what, but it almost feels like a, uh, a Crypt of the Necrodancer where you have to also time attacks uh, uh, with uh, uh, the battle going back and forth. It's not music-based, as far as I can tell. It's just an odd mixture of deck builder and, uh, well, some roguelite, perhaps. Uh, strange, though. 
Anyway, you're up. Um, I've gotten a lot of just like sex. As you do, I, I just want to see what, got, uh, what Sanguine Rose is because, right? I mean, Sanguine Rose actually looks fairly tasteful versus this game made by horny NPC games, uh, I, where it literally I says mean, in well, the description, well, the first, like a uh, uh, screenshot, right? Yeah, but no, this the objective of this game is to get home unmolested. I'm just moving past that. I don't want to give it any publicity because it looks like a really shitty bad cash grab thingy just relying on on boobs. <laughs> Boy, that's uh that's oh, saying is... something for you. Yeah. This looks neat though. Um mod and play link mod and play. This looks like an updated version or like someone saw um ah shit, what's the thing um in like the ar- part of the orange box or whatever where you could make stuff and people created like tons of games and game modes and Gary's mod? Gary's mod yeah there we go this looks like someone saw that and said you know what we should make a new Gary's mod well, there, more... well there's a Gary's mod 2 being in development so this is not no, that no this is not that this is a different developer I skipped past it but because a... there's a lot of bad review so I had it up before Gotcha. I do have something that looks a little interesting. Uh, but go ahead and keep talking. Oh, no, that oh. was basically all I had to say about it. So I mean, I can give you another one. I'm already uh, on my well, next one. I have Circle Empires Rivals. Uh, a fast-paced multiplayer RTS where you and your friends take control of your own tiny kingdoms and conquer the world made of circles. Each one is ever flying with enemies to fight, monsters to hunt, and loot to hoard. But watch out, friends can become rivals rather quickly so uh, essentially a very fast paced RTS uh, has almost a flash feel to it just the way it's drawn I guess where the world's being built up from the looks of it as you're exploring uh, almost like a uh, a 4x game Mm -hmm. so you're just uh, trying to gather territory and build uh, take over the world essentially uh Something interesting, at least. And it's also fairly cheap for at least RTS. Yeah. So, you're up. All right. Help will come tomorrow. Um, I mostly latched onto this because of the setting. So, in an uninhabited Siberian wilderness in the wake of the October Revolution, a group of passengers survives the mysterious catastrophe of a Trans-Siberian railway train. They must endure in harsh, ice-clad climates until rescue arrives, facing many dangers, their own weakness, and above all, their own prejudices. I like the setting, um, the idea of when this is, and both what was going on sort of culturally in Russia at the time. Um, and if they really pull off the idea of like sort of class-based, like literally like socioeconomic class-based gameplay, where these people are going to have interpersonal conflicts with one another... Um, that looks really cool. And this looks more like sort of a strategy, more of a strategy based thing for your survival as opposed to go get resources and craft a campfire and make food. I mean, there's probably a little bit of that, but this looks like it's a lot more, um, menu based, uh, with some visual novel kind of choose your own adventure type dialogue and choices. Looks neat. Uh, looking at this one. So, Legend, The Legend of Heroes, Trials of Cold Steel 3. So, this is newly released. Uh, well, no? Uh, I thought it was uh, more new. Uh, March 23rd, so about a month old now. Let me paste a link in as I was grabbing the title as well. So, the third in this series, uh, it says that it's an overarching story, so you may want to start off with the earlier titles if you're new to the series, like, well, I am. Assuming that they're on Steam, of course. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, it looks like uh, it starts with uh, Charles of this. Uh, it looks like it actually has, uh, this is part of an interlinking uh, uh, series of uh, games, so I ha- I've seen a couple of the earlier ones. Uh, but it also looks like it lo- uh, links in with Trials in the Sky, which was one I, I, I wanted to pick up at one point, which I still want to pick up as well. So making its own little inner uh, uh, link to web of games, I guess. Always fun to see uh, games that are tied together like this. I, 
although it makes it a little harder for an outsider to come in. But the older games looks like they are uh, come. Uh, they do come down rather quickly in price. Uh, tra- uh, Trails in the Sky is down to twenty bucks. The first uh, tra- uh, t- uh, Trials of Cold Steel is forty instead of uh, the usual sixty. So. But a rather nice art style overall. It has a rather clean, uh, like uh, Valkyria Chronicles. It has that uh, sort of uh, rather simplistic uh, but clean look to it for a JRPG. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And also the the character design feels a bit like it as well. Although, obviously not World War II-esque. But maybe it's just because both are uh, more military-based. But this has uh, more of a sci-fi feel to it. A lot of DLC, uh, some uh, freebie, but holy shit, they have a lot of DLC. $132 worth of DLC. It looks like it's all either, well, consumables, which hopefully aren't uh, a uh, requirement of gameplay, but also a lot of cosmetics. So, damn. Looks like a a lot of the freebies are consumables that you could just uh, get. So, not sure how I feel about that. That, that's one thing that always gets me on uh, JRPGs is just how much uh, DLC they have tied to consumables or, or to uh, cosmetics, I should say. So, you're up. Uh, this is my last one, but it is an interesting looking one. Um, and I just, I just pulled it up, so let me get the link right now. Mad Experiments um, Escape Room. So it looks like, I mean, a, a first person escape room type of thing. Kind of like we were here, except more for single player. Um, it does say it has multiplayer online co op. So, you know, maybe there's a. That would work well. But um, just by looking at the screenshots, they're all of just one person. I don't see any other people listed in any of these screenshots. So. It might just be designed for one. But anyways, the idea of escape rooms is is really fascinating to me. You know, essentially playing video games in with real life, solving puzzles to, um, you know, figure something out or complete a goal and ultimately get out of the room. And then you're trying to do it in the fastest time as possible uh, when you go and do it. So the idea of that in a video game, if it's good, sounds intriguing to me. Which I know it exists, and we were here, and we were here too. And both of those games are good. But more of that, please. Okay, uh, my last one. Uh, Pete the Head. This is my next to last by Pete the Head. My last one. And I don't think it's worth talking about. F1 2020. Pretty much the only F1 racing you're going to get this year, from the looks of it. Uh, looks like they're focusing more on team creation this time around with a new uh, My Team mode. So building your own team from scratch with a custom driver uh, and facilities behind it. So uh, there's a nice change of pace instead of just updating rule sets. Mm-hmm. And it looks like they're working on more uh, difficulty modes as well, uh, allowing for more casual play. Still not sure if it's worth the 60 bucks if you uh, have a recent one, but uh, it's uh, if you want to get into F1 racing, it's uh, well, about the only racing you're going to get this year, right? Yeah, more than likely. Um, all right. So you said that was yours, and then it was mine. Yep. So then that means Rage, hit him with a sword. Well, I've been Caffeine Rage. Maybe someday you'll ca- catch me back on YouTube gaming with Caffeine Rage. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Game with CR, or you can be my friend on Steam, Caffeine Rage, as well. And you've been? Gaming Psychologist. You can find me on the YouTubes by searching for Gaming Psychologist on Twitter at JMA4707. Or you can be my friend on Steam by sending a request to JRthur4707. And if you wish to know exactly what episode of the part Edcast you're coming from, the password for this week is Sex Perverts. <laughs> sex perverts. Sex perverts. Yeah, I haven't, uh, uh, didn't have my list open, so I had to grab one just at random. So there you go, right? Yep, randomly pulled that out of the ether. Sex perverts. Well, uh, you did. Wink. Uh, if you wish to uh, lodge a complaint against the sex perverts, uh, you can do so via podcast at gmail.com or just send us your letters, voicemails, gaming related topics, or tweet them to us via podcast on the Twitter. Our lovely, lovely patrons are to blame for all this. You can find out more at patreon.com slash VGL podcast. 
And once again, our lovely patrons help with our Podbean. BGLpodcast.podbean.com, which hosts the RSS feed, show notes, links to all our stuff online. Or you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, or your podcatcher of choice. Our intro and outro music is on the ground, and our Discovery Cube music is doobly doo both by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at incomputech.com and... As always, as this lovely music starts to roll across my voice, bye-bye now. See you next time. Bye-bye.